I'm just starting up another video for just a few minutes uh, right now. I'm going to maneuver this telescope. The wind has died down enough. I'm taking a hold of this handle in my hand right here. And the wind is still swaying around a bit because I don't have that heavy eyepiece in on the other side to balance it. So, as you can see right now, I'm having a little trouble balancing it. I'll show you how I'm swinging it around. I'm going to show you how this setting circle moves, if it'll still show up. I'll try and hold this as steady as I can. You can see the numbers actually change and swivel around with the, with the moving in. The, right now it's moving in right ascension. That's what they call the, the direction around the polar axis. The clock drive is not actually running yet, but what I'm going to do is turn the clock drive switch on right now if it'll stay stable enough. Wait a minute, first I have to switch this thing on right here. The power bar, I think you might be able to see the light there that is turned on. The little red light down there, there it is. That's the power bar, it's kind of behind some wires. Okay, here comes a toggle switch that actually turns the clock drive on right here. There it goes. Can you hear the hum of it? There's a green light right there. That's the clock drive actually running. It's actually, that's a drive corrector. The clock drive motor is in this box right over there with a big 11 inch diameter gear in it. Okay, what I'm going to do is move, move this around. The clock drive is actually functioning right now. I may turn that off in a minute because the, the, I want to wait for the wind to die down a bit before I do too much to it. Okay, now you can see this maneuvering around in right ascension. I'm not changing the declination very much. I'll show you how the telescope swivels like that. You can see it swiveling relative to the background of the tree. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and give you a look at this setting circle right here. Move, maneuver, I don't think there's enough light, but there might be. It's very awkward to fit the camera in here with this tripod, but I'm going to give it a try. Okay, I'm just going to try and move the telescope upward in an angle higher up in the sky. You might be able to see the actual numbers changing on the wheel. What I'll do is just zoom in a little bit. There it goes. That's the way to do it. The focus might not be very good, but at least you'll see this moving. See the numbers moving relative to that toothpick? That noise you're hearing is a, is a, a red cardinal singing in the background. We have all kinds of birds here because I put water out for them all summer. You can see those black numbers moving in the background. That And there's a spring. That indicates the uh, declination. Watch. I'll move it downward a bit. Hopefully I can hold the camera steady enough so you can see what's going on. The numbers are shifting, see? Now it's moving farther. The telescope is aiming farther and farther toward south in the sky now. That black dot there actually indicates the uh, actual declination rather than the numbers. That's just an old uh, measuring tape, like a plastic measuring tape that's flexible. That's what, what's on there now. And that black dot, there's some faint numbers there. You can just bear, under the number 32, right there, you can just barely see the number 1 if you look carefully. I'll hold this really steady and see if you can see the number 1 right there under the 32. That indicates a declination of plus 10 degrees, right where that long black line is. That little dot by the 32 indicates a declination of plus 15 degrees, which will moved upward. I'll go up to 15. Yeah, and then you see a 2 right there, right by the 33. There's a 2 right there, it's hard to see. Right with a long black line drawn in with a marking pen. That's 20 degrees northern declination. So right now it's at about... Um, Right now it's at about uh, 5 degrees, yeah, about plus 5 degrees north declination. You can see a zero in there if you really look carefully. I'll see if I can focus in on the zero. Uh, right by, no, it's very hard to see right there, right by the bottom toothpicks. Yeah, there's a little zero there. I'll aim it up, down, I'll aim it down a little and then it'll pop up. Right by the 30. At the bottom of the zero on the 30, there's another little tiny zero, and that indicates the celestial equator right at zero degrees declination. And right now, it's just passing the top toothpick, which means that that black line right there, right, at, right in the middle of the 30, is indicating zero degrees declination. Okay, I'm just going to take a look now and see what the collimation is like when it's turned there. Now, it's not too far. Oh, I don't think so. Not, well, with that much wind, maybe I can hold it steady. Hard to do this with one hand when I'm manipulating around. Yeah, it's good enough that I can leave it, I think. That's not, it's out just a little bit, but it's not bad. 
it's not worth not worth trying to change it now that's because the whole tube is so massive and long that it flexes under its own weight when I move it around I sort of have to collimate it for one declination range which tonight just happens to be almost overhead in the sky so it's collimated well enough now that I can leave it alone it's getting maybe about 70 percent of its normal light gathering power in the position it's in but that's good enough for just taking a quick look at the sky with if I were doing something really intense I would collimate it more accurately okay so anyway uh, my advice is not to ever try building a telescope like this if I were doing it over again and had enough money, I would just buy a Celestron 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with one of the best go to mountings on it. And then I would, um, what I would do with that is put it in a rotating building with a very wide slit with the, the claw mechanism that I was showing you. I'm just going to zoom this back to a wide angle again so you can see the 5 inch finder scope. I'll be putting the eyepieces on these in a few minutes. Oh, yeah, I want, let's see. Uh, it's just reaching six minutes in the recording now. I'll see if I can show you the uh, the eyepiece actually popping in. I'm not sure whether I can do that or not. I'll have to unfurl the telescope legs a little bit to do that, I think. That can be done. Pardon me for fiddling with this. It doesn't take long to do this. Okay, while I'm doing this, I'll tell you that how I figured the mirrors is, I ground and polished the primary mirror. It's about almost an F7, which I wanted to make it an F5 Newtonian, but I didn't use very good abrasive. I would advise grinding a mirror like that with number 60 silicon carbide from someplace like, uh, there's a place in California that, that'll sell it. I can't remember what, what the name of Pacific. No, it's, uh, I forget what the name of the, the place is now, but it's, uh, it's in California that sells telescope abrasive, abrasives and it's pretty, and other telescope making products. I got the, the, the mirror blanks there too. It's pretty good, but get the silicon carbide, and uh, also you have to be very, very careful with polishing agents. Uh, get one from a real good source, like Efton Science in Toronto or something like that. Just giving you a view of the tube while I talk a little bit about how I made the mirrors, just for a minute. And uh, uh, I made a lot of mistakes, but I, I ended up using rather bad rough grinding abrasive to do the... Uh, to do the grinding so I ended up with a long focal ratio because I got just tired of the grinding process what you're going to see me do if I can do it is get this tripod sort of back out of the way a little bit like this just shine it in here aim it in here like this actually I think the other direction might be better but I'll, I'll do this this way this time I am manipulate this around like this and I'll see if I can show you how the eyepiece pops in a very crude way of doing things it's still recording all right yeah, so what I did was I ended up with a, uh, a, a surface on the primary mirror that was fairly close to a decent spherical shape and uh, around F7 and uh, it was very smooth and I decided not to parabolize it so I did the figuring on the secondary mirror instead, the 8 inch. And how I did that was I divided the, uh, whoops, there goes the thing moving around again, this is going to be a chore. Uh, I uh, divided the uh, the, the mathematically divided up, this is a giant eyepiece by the way, this is a homemade eyepiece, see the, the double A's there, I don't know if you can see them, but that's a Huygens eyepiece, it's homemade, it's full length around 4 inches, but I'm not sure, it gives about 150 power, that's my low power eyepiece right now on the thing, and I just have to slide it in here like this, the double A side, whoops, the telescope tube is moving, won't be so bad when I get this thing in. Here it goes. It goes right in here like this. If I can get these wings, these are just wings for like you'd use for old fashioned wooden storm windows. It pops right in here like this. And these wings go over it and it's pretty solid in there. The wings are a little loose. This is the focusing, crude me focusing mechanism I can just use for this, this eyepiece just to get a, it doesn't have, it, nice to focus it, but it's not, doesn't have to be too perfect overall. This is wiggles out like this to focus with. That's about the final focusing position approximately right there. The focusing is very critical on this. The separation of the mirrors, if you separate them closer by about uh, something like a quarter of an inch, to, like if you, the spacing between those two mirrors, the, the 8 inch and the 20 inch, it will move the focal plane outward by 3 inches. So it's very sensitive to being moved. You have to have the, the distance separation just right to get it decent focus on it. Uh, so anyway, what I did was I divided the primary mirror up into um, 
into uh, three annular rings mathematically. And I already had already measured 14 zones to get the surface profile very accurate. And then what I did was I, um, I, um, I used ratio and proportion to find the corresponding uh, three annular rings on the secondary mirror. And then I, I calculated, uh, using Texrow's book, How to Make a Telescope, I calculated, um, I calculated the, uh, the uh, longitudinal aberration at the, at, the, at the center of curvature of the secondary mirror that I would have to have to compensate for the errors on the primary mirror in those three annular rings on the primary. And in, in Textro's book, How to Use a Telescope, he gives simple algebraic equations how to do that, but it took me about a month's work. In fact, the whole telescope took approximately 100 pages of handwritten mathematical calculations to do the job. But anyway, the final wavefront error, according to my calculations, is approximately one-sixth. That's about, uh, about, yeah, one over six um, of a wavelength of normal uh, light, blue-green light, that you'd see with, you know, the brightest, the, the best light, that's the eye to which, the light wavelength to which the eye is most sensitive about one-sixth of a wavelength peak to valley. And that's the final wavefront error. That doesn't, that's not what the mirrors are. That's the wavefront at the final image. So it worked pretty well. But uh, that's my calculations. I'm not sure how good they are. But, but the whole thing was a nightmare to build. I would, as I say, I would, if I were doing it over again, I would get a Celestron 14. Instead of having the roll-off roof, which gets very bad protection against the wind, I would have a rotating building. It doesn't look like a dome, but it would be on a circular track with a wide track so that those claws could fit under it to prevent it from being blown off by the wind, and then have a wide slit at least five feet wide in the dome with a rolling structure that would be easy to roll on and off to get the slit open and closed, and that way the building would be much more convenient to use than this one. But on the other hand, like this is an awesome piece of equipment to actually use, like it's just an amazing thing to look through, so I'm not really complaining about it much. What, now I'm, uh, I'm going to just take a minute and I'm going to clamp this thing into place because the wind is still blowing around a bit. I'm going to turn the clock drive off temporarily. There it goes. I'm just going to clamp this in place so that it won't blow all, all over the place with the wind. I think you might be able to sort of see what I'm doing there, but I'm not sure. Uh, this bar should really be clamped into place until I'm actually using it because the wind is just a little bit too much for this thing right now. I wonder if I'm exceeding my 15 minute limit. Okay, this clamps right into, this should really be a bit more horizontal, and now my camera tripod's going to be in the way, which is, I can move it out fairly easily. What you're now seeing me moving the tripod around and, and doing some surgery in the telescope. Just sort of watch me move this thing downward now. I usually move it around very slowly, about like that. I don't like to move things around too quickly when they're this big and massive. Something will break or fall apart or... I hit my head on this thing <clears throat> when I first built it, and <clears throat> I got it all padded now with multiple layers of old t-shirts that were all torn. They're, they're wonderful things for using for stuff like that, all tied on with some plastic guarding cord. But that's a really good thing to have available. Now, this thing fits into here. There's, there's a little, like a hook and an eye here, I'll show you. See the hook on the eye right there? And that just fits in, and there's another one on the other end. And that, that one fits down on the, on the pier right there. That pier is by, by the way, it's uh, six by six uh, pieces of wood that are all bolted together above the surface of the ground. And then that goes down to a depth of more than six feet in the ground, set in five bags of concrete. This, t this mounting used to hold a 12 inch telescope, but now you can see it holds a larger one. So the, and the whole mounting is actually, it looks massive, but it's actually sort of undersized for the telescope. Now I just have to rotate this down a bit and it'll be, it won't be susceptible to the wind blowing around for a while. I think I might be exceeding my 15 minutes, but that's okay. I'll break it up into another video so that you won't lose any of this. Because it must be fun to listen to at least once. You'll probably get very bored with it after a while. So, but anyway, I'll give you another shot of the whole thing as I walk. Let's see how many minutes I have left. Yeah, not much. It's just a, a little bit of time. I'll give you a shot of this, this, this winch right here. And the whole telescope turned downward like this. Maybe you can see the moon up in the sky above it way up there, probably not. There's a moon up there tonight, but I can't reach it with this mount. Because this only this is a transit mount. It only goes across the uh, due south. So there it goes. 
Like it only, that's the southern part of the sky. I'll tell you about that some other time. Here it goes. I might as well stop it right now.